as but Awesome. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for making time during the summer to join us. We really appreciate that. Um, we're going to go ahead and begin. So I know we have some familiar faces here and some people I haven't met yet. Um, so I'd like for the USBE staff to um, introduce ourselves. Um, so for those of you who haven't met, my name is Andrew Grove, and I am the Apple Support Specialist. Um, Lisa, would you like to go next? Sure. I'm Lisa McLaughlin. I'm the Educator Preparation Program Coordinator. And I'm Camilla Capella. I'm the Apple Program Monitor. Jennifer, you want to introduce yourself as well? Sure. I'm Jennifer Prince. I'm the Educator Preparation Competency Specialist. Right, and I'm going to put a link to this um, slides in the chat, so you're welcome to follow along and open any links as we go. So one thing that we like to do is um, we have to start our meetings with learning intentions and success criteria just as a way of um, providing direction and so that you understand what what we're hoping you'll learn by the end of the meeting. Sorry, I have this fly. <laughs> Um, so for today's meeting, um, by the end of the meeting, our success criteria is that by the end of the meeting, um, Apple directors will be able to do two things. One is uh, locate resources and supports for implementing program requirements, and the other is to assess the next steps for implementing program requirements. Um, so we're hoping, especially those of you that are brand new starting the summer, that, um, that you'll have an idea of, of at least being able to make a game plan for what you need to do next. Um, on our agenda today, um, Camilla is going to talk about educator licensing a little bit, and then um, I will talk about most of the Apple topics. So we'll do an overview of the Apple program. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the model program framework in the director's handbook. And then we'll spend a lot of time talking about the professional learning plan and licensing requirements for Apple candidates. And then Lisa is going to talk a little bit about the annual report as well as a couple other um, changes that are happening in licensing. All right. Hey, Camilla, take it away. Okay. So we're just briefly going to go over the basics of licensing structure so that you guys have an idea of the different licenses and how they can apply in your situations and for your Apple candidates. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So we have three levels of educator licenses and they all do different things. Um, you're most likely familiar with the professional license. That's where someone has completed an educator preparation program, whether at a university or through an alternate program like Apple. Then there's the associate license where they've met some of the requirements similar to an associate, similar to a professional license. They have to have like they have to have a background check and have done the ethics review and they need to have a degree. They've likely done some of the competency required if they're doing like secondary math. They also have completed the pedagogical modules. Um, and so it's temporary. It lasts for three years. Um, that's a license that a lot of your Apple candidates are likely to have starting out. There's also an LA specific where a uh, school can say we found this individual and we think they're great for this position we want to hire them and we're taking accountability for how they do at our school so they also have to have background check and the ethics review and the school board needs to apply for this on behalf of the educator because they're taking responsibility for them so they've done a lot less but um they can teach it at, at your school specifically if they have a license there can we go to the next slide thanks so we have these three different license levels and they can be applied um, across different license levels and areas and endorsements. So you might have someone at your school who they found for early childhood, who's got an LA specific and um, the school thinks they're doing great and they're just on that license level, just at that school. You might also have someone who has an associate license for secondary with, a sec with, a, with an associate endorsement. So someone might be teaching secondary math on an AEL license. Then most of the staff are probably going to have professional licenses 
So they would have a professional license level, professional license area, and a professional endorsement in that situation. So maybe you have someone who's teaching elementary and they have a professional level license. Okay, do we have any questions about this so far? Okay, sounds like not. Okay, so for the, so an educator license is, is a little bit like a tree. This is the best analogy we've come up with. You have your license and then you have a license area, which is a little bit like a branch. And then you have your endorsements, which are a little bit like leaves. You can't have branches and leaves without having the trunk of a tree. So you can't really have, so, so an educator can't have an endorsement without a license area. They can't have a license area without a license for it to attach to. So that's kind of how they connect as far as how those work. All right, so there are 14 different license areas that people can obtain. And out of those 14, there are four that an Apple program can recommend someone for. And that's early childhood, elementary education, secondary, or CTE. The others, they have to go through a university program to meet those requirements. But um, for, for those four, as Apple directors, you can recommend people for those. There's also a very a varied amount of endorsements that can apply to those different licenses or level, sorry, that can apply to those different licenses and, and areas. And if you have questions about what those are specifically, you can talk about those a little bit later. All right, thanks, Camilla. Mm -hmm. um, so next we're gonna give an overview of the Apple program. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the context behind it, the history, and then some of the data as well. So um, anytime you see something that says like R277, that means it's a board rule. And so we reference board rules a lot. Um, so educator preparation is primarily in um, R277-303 and R277-304. Uh, so in R277-303, um, it defines an educator preparation program as a program that's intended to prepare individuals to meet the requirements of the Utah professional license. Um, and then it also clarifies who can administer an, an EPP, so educator preparation program, we, we usually refer to it as an EPP. So it says that um, an EPP can be administered by an institution of higher ed, such as university, um, an individual LEA, such as a school district charter school or accredited private school, um, a consortium of charters or districts or a combination, um, or the board, which would be like the Apple SPED program. So special education and um, speech language technicians, those are run through USB. The alternative programs are. Um, and then it also says that uh, programs must be approved by the superintendent and reviewed. Another word we use for that is monitored every five years. So and we'll talk a little bit about um, monitoring what to expect later hey andrew yep we we got a question here about licensing so i think we should probably answer that before we okay, move on yeah yep what from susan she says can you explain the difference between a cte license and a secondary license yes great question susan so a cte license um there's a couple differences one is you cannot have a bachelor's degree and have a cte license you may have a bachelor's degree and have CTE endorsements. Um, so the CTE license is specific to candidates who hold certain um, like industry certifications. Sometimes it, it may be like a doppel license, um, like for an electrician or an auto, automotive mechanic. Um, but that's the primary difference. Most candidates will have, and we'll talk about this a little later too, but most candidates will have a bachelor's degree which means even if they're going to add a CTE endorsement, they would be on a secondary license. Um, and some of the CTE endorsements cannot be added on a CTE license, which sounds strange, but some CTE endorsements require a bachelor's degree and can only be added to a secondary license. And then there's some that could be on a, some CTE endorsements could be a secondary endorse, a secondary license or a CTE license. Um, does that answer your question, Susan? 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, to be honest, we I like processing associate licenses. I've probably done a couple thousand and maybe only given out like two or three CTE licenses ever. It's almost always been a secondary license. So, so you may see them, but they're not super common. Um, all right. I, I will also add, because I know this was a question we got a lot when we first started, is coming from an educator preparation program perspective, um, people who are earning a CTE license area are expected to meet all the requirements of a professional license, including the general teacher preparation competencies and their content competencies. There was some confusion about whether, you know, the CTE license area people had to do the general teacher preparation competencies and the answer is yes they do and so the only really technically the only difference between the cte license and the secondary license is that cte generally do not have a bachelor's degree but they have the industry equivalent of whatever the bachelor's degree is and as andrew said there's there's certain areas that the superintendent or the board has identified as those areas that have an industry equivalent to a bachelor's degree. So we can provide more information on what, usually it's like automotive technician or welding or um, like construction management sometimes. So those, those areas. So, um, so just to provide a little bit of context behind the Apple program. Um, so before July, 2020, um, there were two programs, um, ARL and APT. Those are both sunsetted now, but those used to be the alternative preparation programs, and they were primarily administered by um, USBE. So in 2020, they decided to shift the administration from USBE to the school districts. So while USBE does determine slash the board and the superintendent determine the requirements, um, it is administered at the local level by Apple directors. Um, but it, it is, the requirements in board rule are the same. So whether a candidate is going through a university program or an Apple program, they do have the same requirements. Um, so on this slide, we're just gonna talk a little bit about data, some of the, some of the numbers in the Apple program. Um, and this is also a link you're welcome to look at. It just has, um, it's a public facing document on our website that should have um, most of your information on it um, if you are the Apple director. If you are not the Apple director, but you primarily run the program, um, you may not see your name on that list. It's basically a list of um, all the Apple programs, the name of the director, and then their number and email. Um, but right now we have 51 Apple programs and that number usually moves up or down like one or two a year. Um, and as of, so during the 2022-2023 school year, we had over 2,000 candidates enrolled in Apple, which did make it the largest educator preparation program in the state. Um, and so we have an annual report that will be due this fall, and then we'll get the data on how many candidates were enrolled this previous school year. Um, and then we've had over a thousand candidates earn a professional license through Apple, which which is also really exciting. And that is the that's the total number as of a few weeks ago. So it's probably probably higher than that now. All right. Um, next, we'll talk a little bit about the Apple Model Program Framework. So in R two seven seven dash three hundred three. Um, it says the superintendent shall design and maintain a model educator preparation program that meets all requirements of applicable board rules. So if your Apple program was established within the last year or so, um, you probably use the 2023 model program and everyone else probably used the 2020 model program. The primary difference between the updated 2023 version is that um, there are a lot of requirements or redundancy in the old version that we eliminated. So we made it like set six or seven pages shorter. That's the primary difference. That really just highlighted what are the board rule requirements. Um, you should or may have a copy of your approved program. If you don't, you're welcome to reach out to us and we can email you a copy of that.
Um, so about a year and a half ago, we released a resource called the Apple Director's Handbook. Um, the intent behind the handbook was that it would basically serve as like under one roof are the answers to lots of questions that people can ask, but not all the questions because we get new questions every day. But um, it, the Apple Director's Handbook talks about just about everything. <laughs> um, some of the topics that you may be interested in, and we'll talk about some of these today, would be things like coursework approval, the professional learning plan we'll talk about a lot today, um, demonstrated competency, program review information. I even just had a conversation this morning with an Apple Director about remediation, and that's in the handbook as well. So like what what to do with candidates who have been in the program but don't seem very motivated or maybe haven't been making any progress. So there's a lot of a lot of great information in there that I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with. Any questions about that before we move on to the next? We did get a question about enrollment, and I think we could probably talk a little bit about that now, but we'll also talk more about it later. It just says, can people be enrolled, quote unquote, before they have their associate license? Yes, so that um, that's a good question. And, and we will talk about that later as well. So the enrollment criteria is determined by each program. Um, so there are some programs that would say in order to be, and I just saw Jesslyn's question as well, there are some programs that would say in order to be enro enrolled in our Apple program, you must have an associate license and be the teacher of record. Or there's other programs that may say, you know, we don't really care if you have an associate license. Um, as long as you're employed, then, then you can be enrolled in the program. Um, others may say, we'll work with some people who aren't the teacher of record. So there's lots of, each of you should have a program enrollment um, criteria that we should also have. Um, so if you're not sure what your program's criteria is, um, email us and we can, we can see if we could find that for you. You're also welcome to update it or redefine it based on circumstances, so. Mm -hmm. I will, I will add that we, the first year we asked for an annual report, which we'll also talk more about later, we asked all the programs to tell us what their enrollment policy is. And that was back in 2021. So it may have changed since then, and we may not be aware of it. But if, if your program was in existence in 21, and you submitted an annual report, um, we likely have some kind of documentation about what your program's enrollment policy is, but we have we haven't necessarily updated it since then. So um, we we encourage all programs to have a policy so that they can help answer questions that come up like this. And it's nice if we know what that is so that we can just um, help field questions that come up and become aware of, you know, what criteria you're establishing to um, allow programs in, or candidates into your programs. But um, we can... If you have questions about that, we can try and find what we have documentation of, given that it might be a couple of years old. Any other questions about that before we switch? All right. Um, okay, so next we're gonna talk about a lot of the licensing requirements, which, will, which are also the Apple requirements. Um, we used to have this slide used to be called the four pillars of educator preparation. We only have three pillars now, so I, maybe we have to call it something else. I don't know what I don't know what stands on three pillars, but um, one of one of the requirements is no longer a requirement. So so the three pillars are general teacher preparation. Um, those that may also be synonymous with uh, general teacher preparation competencies or general pedagogy. Um, the next one is content specific knowledge and pedagogy. And then um, we also have clinical experiences and disposition competencies. Okay, so we're going to spend a little while here talking about the professional learning plan. Um, we also refer to it as the PLP. So from here on out, when I see PLP, we're talking about the professional learning plan. Um, and the, the plan is a document that outlines the requirements for a professional license. So each individual will have their own PLP established in your program. Um, and while the requirements for licensure are the same, the PLP may look different from candidate to candidate, depending on what kind of license they're 
seeking to earn or um, previous experience or the pathways they choose to meet the requirements um, on the professional license plan or professional learning plan. We have created um, PLP templates that I'll show you, I think on the next slide, um, that you are welcome to use. And you can also create your own templates. A lot of programs do, and that's fine. The important thing is you cannot, um, you cannot exclude any information that's on our template <laughs> or any of the licensing requirements that are on our template if you decide to make your own template. Um, so the PLP needs to be established within 30 days of enrollment in the program. And we already talked about um, each program gets to define, have their own definition of enrollment. Some may just say, you know, when somebody is hired, whatever, you know, they're enrolled. Um, and that's totally fine. Some programs may say, you know, we don't want them to be enrolled when they're hired because maybe we're not sure we're going to bring them back the next year or we want to see, you know, how they adjust to teaching before we determine if we want to enroll them in Apple. So again, you get to decide what that definition is, but from, from, when, from when they're considered enrolled, the PLP needs to be established within 30 days. So some questions you'll want to consider um, when you're creating the PLP is, does the candidate have a bachelor's degree? Um, if not, there's not many options for them to get a license outside some of the CTE license area and endorsements. Um, so generally speaking, most or all of your candidates will probably have a bachelor's degree. Um, and then you'll wanna know what is the bachelor's degree in? And is it something that could maybe be related to the license or endorsement that they, they're gonna seek? Um, you also wanna consider what does the candidate want to earn a license or endorsement in? So the candidate may be teaching science um, but maybe they really want to teach math and they have a degree in math and yeah, whatever, right? Um, and so that kind of leads to the next question of what do they need? So which license or endorsement do they need to be qualified for their assignment in Cactus? So what do they need to be qualified? Now, it's important to keep in mind that maybe they need a science endorsement to be qualified with a secondary license. Um, but they really wanna teach math and they're actually really close to being done with math, maybe because some of the prior experience that they have, um, you can still recommend them for a license in math and just say, you're gonna keep working um, toward the endorsement for science. That's totally fine. Um, you would just want to consider maybe how, how you would support them in doing that. Um, and maybe with some of the clinical experiences, you may want to see them teach math before they've been recommended for a math endorsement. Um, so some questions to consider. And then you would also want to know, has the candidate already been enrolled in another teacher preparation program? If they have, there's a chance they may have some experiences or knowledge that could be counted towards some of the licensing requirements um, that would maybe shorten their time in the program a little bit. So any questions about those before we look at um, some of the PLP checklists? And I'm not seeing anything, so we're going to keep going. So we have two um, PLP checklists or templates on our website. Um, we have an elementary version, or we have an elementary um, checklist and a secondary checklist. Um, I'm not going to necessarily talk about everything on this list, but I'm just going to point out a few things. So at the top, or on your own template, um, we definitely need to know when were they admitted into the program and then see the PLP established within 30 days of that date. Um, some programs would say you're not in the program until you have a PLP, which means those dates would just be the same, and that's fine. Um, you'll want to collect official transcripts for any coursework that you're going to use. Um, or if USBE has the transcript, we can also send it to you, or as long as we have it on file, that's fine too. And you're welcome to use an unofficial copy if you know that we have the official copy. Um, we ask the candidates be evaluated two times per year. One of those evaluations needs to be a summative evaluation that aligns to the Utah Effective Teaching Standards. And the other needs, it can also be summative or it may be an informal walkthrough or like a formative evaluation. In this section, we have um, a list of the general teacher competencies. So 
it's important to know that the courses do not have to have this title, but they do need to align to the general teacher competencies. And we'll show you those later. Um, so the course definitely does not have to have this exact name, um, but it needs to align to the same competencies. So one thing that's unique about elementary is on the PLP template, we list the elementary content requirements. Um, so right now in board rule, um, board rule is very specific about the topics that need to be covered for literacy and math for elementary teachers. So, so we say those have to be literacy and math coursework. Um, it is the board rule is not very specific about what candidates need to know for science, PE, social studies, child development, and fine arts. So right now we're we're accepting just general college coursework for those. Um, so like biology, you know, 1010 is fine for science. That's also going to change. <laughs> but but for it, for the next year, any candidate that enrolls in your program and all the candidates in your program, um, that's that's the requirement and expectation. Any questions about the coursework or the competencies? All right. So there's something else to keep in mind. So when you have candidates who are earning a license in um, elementary or early childhood, um, we have an associate requirement that we call the AEL elementary competencies. Um, so it used to be in order to get an associate license or a professional license in elementary, everybody had to take Praxis 5001. A, two years ago, that changed. Um, and we said, you can either take a combination of 5001 or you can take, and most candidates have already done it anyway in their bachelor's degree, you could complete these credit requirements. So six credits of writing, three credits of math, three credits of history, three credits of social science. Science. This form's a little outdated. Um, it's actually just six credits of science now. So we don't care if it's life science or physical science. There just has to be six credits of science. Um, so the reason you'll want to know about this form is if you do not require candidates to have an associate license, um, then you need to keep a copy of that form on file. If you do require them to have an associate license, then we would just say, it looks like they have an associate license cool in, with elementary. Um, if not, then when we review your program, we would say, can you show us the AEL comp elementary competency form to make sure that they meet um, the minimum requirements for the elementary license? Any questions about that? All right. Um, one of the last things I'll show you. So we have, um, you remember the third pillar for on the slide a couple before was um, the clinical experience competencies. So these are the clinical experience competencies copied directly from board rule. And what you're welcome to do, but this isn't how you have to do it. This would maybe be considered the minimum requirement it would be a written description of how the candidate has demonstrated each of these competencies or had an opportunity to do each of these competencies, like a, attend a meeting, an IEP meeting, or consultation. Some programs, a lot of programs choose to have candidates also collect artifacts, and that's fine. Um, but the minimum expectation is that we have a written description for each of these. So it's a little bit different than the general competencies and the content competencies. OK. Um, and then we also have the secondary checklist. I'm not going to open that one today. Um, the secondary checklist is nearly identical, except it does not have the elementary content and the AEL requirement on it. So other than that, it looks exactly like the elementary checklist. What does it have instead? It, nothing. <laughs> there is one additional course that we require right now called literacy in the content area. So. Um, and then this is on the next slide. No, 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 no. Go back, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> you want the, you want the, um, endorsement form. Content. I can tell what yes. you're going for. Yes. Yes. 
this is also on the next slide, but that's fine. Or the slide after that one, I think. Um, so any candidate being enrolled for a secondary license must have at least one endorsement they're recommended for at the same time. Um, and we'll talk about this in a couple minutes also, but basically um, candidates must have a completed endorsement form on file or, or show on file that they've completed the requirements of at least one endorsement and they have to complete all the requirements. Um, so sometimes there's been a misconception that if someone gets the associate level endorsement, that that's all they have to do. Um, the associate just means they have met the minimum requirements or the minimum competencies. So, so for the associate, we, a lot of times we just see, oh, they have a degree in English. We don't look at anything else. Didn't even open the transcript. Um, there's a lot more requirements besides just having a degree in English. Um, so, so just because they have the associate level does not mean they've met all the professional level requirements. Um, so, so that's something that um, elementary teachers may also have, um, but do not have to have, which is just an endorsement on file. So, and then recommended for that endorsement. Any questions about endorsements? So. So after you've established what requirements your candidate needs to meet, um, you'll want to set up an initial consultation. And during that meeting, you're gonna review the professional learning plan requirements and a timeline for completion. Um, and then you'll, you'll wanna have a discussion about how the candidate wants to demonstrate the requirements. Generally, people take coursework. Um, there's a couple other, we're going to get to this in a minute. There's a couple other, um, primarily one other way that they can demonstrate some of those. Um, and then you also want to make sure that the, uh, the mentor or administrator is involved in the meeting so they understand how they can help the candidate and any responsibilities they may have. Um, we recommend having one follow up meeting, at least one follow up meeting per year with candidates. Some programs have two, so after every semester, even if it's just via email, they'll touch base with the candidate um, just to get updated information on what coursework they've completed, things like that. So um, you'll also want to address um, or maybe have a policy about what your how to handle candidates who aren't making progress. Um, so there, there's different things you can do. You could put them on the candidate on probation and set like specific targets and goals for them to meet. Um, it's kind of up to each Apple program how they want to handle that. Some Apple programs are pretty strict and they'll say, you know, if you don't meet, it, like if we say you're going to do it this semester and take these two classes and you don't, like then you're on probation and you have so much time to have completed that before you're no longer in the Apple program. But um if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to talk about that. But um, So another one of the pillars that we talked about was the general teacher preparation or the general competencies or the general pedagogy. <laughs> um, so under the competencies that we're using right now and for the next year, um, we call those the 2020 general teacher preparation competencies. Most candidates are taking either district coursework or um, university coursework, and that's fine. Um, candidates that already have the knowledge and skills and don't want to take a course may also complete micro-credentials. And we have this crosswalk that I am going to show you. Um, so again, the course may not be called creating and managing a learning environment. That's just what we call it to try to have some kind of like unified language that we refer to the competencies with. Um, it could be called like classroom management or probably a lot of things. Um, but you'll see the competencies in board rule that we categorized as being classroom management based. Um, and then you can see on the right column, the micro credential they would need to complete to demonstrate that competency. So if somebody wants to demonstrate all the competencies under classroom management or creating and managing a learning environment, they need to complete these four micro credentials. 
um, in the instruction technology assessment and planning course, <laughs> and I use quotes because that course is not in board rule. That's just kind of what the university, specifically um, Slick and SUU call the course. Um, you'll see on this, for these competencies, the micro credentials usually demonstrate at least two competencies for each one. Um, for intro to SPED, you'll notice there's actually only one micro credential you have to do for intro to SPED. And then um, the USBE um, SPED law training course. So, so those are the, these are the micro credentials. Strategies for diverse learners has one micro credential for the whole course. So it really just varies from for each competency. Um, but if a candidate does a micro credential, then you'll want to keep the Midas transcript on file. So you, you sign up for the micro credentials in Midas. And then um, once it's completed, it gets posted to the Midas transcript. Um, one common misconception that we get a lot regarding micro credentials is that they're like taking a course or it's like an online course. And our, the way that USBE has developed micro credentials is that they strictly are um, evaluating evidence of competency. So it's if the candidate doesn't already have the knowledge and skills to demonstrate those competencies, doing a micro credential is not going to teach them how to do it. So the micro credential just asks for evidence that they can demonstrate competency. It doesn't provide the knowledge and skills that they need to demonstrate. So they're usually should only be used for candidates who you have determined through some way um, that they already have the knowledge and skills to demonstrate those competencies. They they have been really popular with candidates who maybe have taught for 10 years and feel like they already know how to do classroom management and they don't want to go take a classroom management class. Um, but there should be some kind of avenue um, in your program that could allow candidates who say that they maybe they had another classroom management class as part of their bachelor's degree, but they never got a license or, you know, something like that. Um, that's what micro credentials are for. And if if the candidate doesn't already have the knowledge and skills, then they should probably go take a class. And then there is a third option. Um that we have a few programs that choose to utilize. Um, and we call that demonstrated competency. We're not really gonna talk about that today, um, but if you're interested in, in another route, um, we would need to approve that route. So the programs that are all doing it right now, we've approved. We've approved the route that they're using to do that with candidates. So please reach out if you're interested in that. Um, but so th those are some of the ways and then this and then we have the endorsement forms which have more ways besides just micro credentials and courses the candidates can complete um so like we've mentioned all the secondary cte license area candidates must be recommended for at least one endorsement and all the requirements on the endorsement form have to be completed prior to being recommended um, the endorsement forms do a pretty good job of laying out uh, the options for demonstrating competency. So we're just going to look at the English form here for a second. Um, so if we if we look at some of the requirement areas, like requirement one, it says you can either do the micro credentials or you can do a university course. Um, for requirements two, four, six, and eight, you can either take the courses or you can complete practice 5038 or 5039. Um, so one thing that we're pretty big on when it comes to educator preparation is having multiple ways to demonstrate something. Um, I don't know if there's any endorsements left that do not have at least two ways to demonstrate every requirement. So the endorsement form or the spec sheet should highlight what those areas may look like. Um, so if we go to the English spec sheet, it also talks about um, what the competencies are. And then one thing a lot of these have, a lot of the spec sheets have that's very helpful is a list of approved courses by USBE. Um, 
I'm going to show you one example. So you may notice that, um, what is it, EDPD uh, 5571. So you'll notice that this course for the ELA endorsement offered by USBE meets three of the requirements. So they're not necessarily taking three different courses to meet each of those. Um, they take this course one time, and then they've met three of the requirements. And if they take the Praxis, they met four of the requirements. So now seven of the requirements would be finished if that's the route they choose to go, and they'd have two requirements left. Um, it's also really helpful to know, like, does this class from this university count? Um, and just because it's not listed doesn't mean no, it doesn't count. Um, these are reported by the universities to us. So they tell us, like, here's what our candidates are doing to meet these requirements, which is how the classes get on here. Um, it does not necessarily mean the course is all inclusive, um, but you may have to go back to the spec sheet if you're not sure if the course counts and look at the course description and then look at what, for example, what do you need to do for an adolescent literacy requirement and then see if those are the same. What I would really recommend doing is just asking um, our ELA specialists in that case if the course would count um, if you don't see it on that list. Any questions about any of that endorsements, endorsement forms, spec sheets? All right. Um, so we have what's called retiring endorsement forms. Um, they can be located in the Apple Directors collaboration folder, which we do have a link to in these slides. However, um, there's almost no reason at this point that anyone would want to do a retiring form. The new forms are much more flexible and um, what can count to meet the requirements. So the important thing to know though, is if somebody is using a retiring form, um, they need to be recommended by June 30th, 2025. Um, and some of, the endorse some of the endorsements simply will not exist anymore. Um, one that comes to mind is math level three will not exist after June 30th, 2025. So anyone that has it will continue to have it, but nobody else could be awarded the endorsement after then. So it's something to keep in mind. You may want to review, I mean, as you review all the candidate files in your program as you take over, you may want to check the endorsement forms and make sure um, if it is one of these retiring endorsement forms that the candidate is almost done. And then we talked about the elementary content. Uh, those requirements are listed on the elementary checklist. Any other questions before we talk about clinical experiences? Andrew, I have a question. Yeah, John. If they're on an old form, can they change to the new form? If they're yeah. already, can yeah, they good switch question. them to the newer form? As long as they meet licensing requirements when they're recommended, yes. Okay. Yep. As long as, as long as you have um, documented one of the forms requirements, you know they they're welcome to switch. Okay. Um, well, I think that's kind of what we talked about earlier. I just want to make sure that I understood. Yeah. That. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so, they... to provide some context to John's question a little bit, um, so a, a professional learning plan is is very similar to a contract with a candidate. Um, and so the question has arisen, like, can a contract change? Um, and the answer is like, yes, it can change. Um, and Lisa would, will probably know the exact like timeline for this, but like an endorsement form, it can change, but there's usually a year's notice. And even I, I think, Lisa can correct me if I'm wrong, if you started on the form, you're still welcome to finish that form. I could be wrong about that though. Um, Yes, except for when there is a um, a deadline. So, for example, our retiring endorsement forms are going to expire on June 30th, 2025. And we have announced that for more than a year. <laughs> I think it's been about four years now that those, uh, those endorsements will end on June 30th, 2025. So if you had a candidate who is currently using a retiring endorsement form, they may continue to use it up until June 30th, 2025. 
if they don't get their license and their professional endorsement by June 30th, 2025, they will have to automatically be transferred over to the new endorsement forms because they will no longer be able to earn the endorsement using the retiring endorsement requirements. So they're welcome to change now if they want. And if you want, you know, if and it's like if you agree and their principal agrees or their the candidate agrees, you can change them at any time. Um, but if they don't finish and earn that endorsement by June 30th, 2025, they will have to switch over to the new endorsement forms and meet the requirements that are on there. Um, the big one I can mention is science. Um, every science endorsement now requires a 3D science class. So if they don't finish on the retiring endorsement form by June 30th, 2025, then they will have to go take a 3D science class to meet the requirements of the new endorsement form. Any other questions about that? All right. Thanks for asking that, John. That was a good question. Um, all right, so next we're gonna talk a little bit about the clinical experiences. Um, and I'm just gonna read the definitions. There's a couple in board rule. Um, so in R277-304, it defines a clinical experience as a structured opportunity in which a program candidate is mentored by a licensed educator and evaluated by a teacher leader, school administrator, or university preparation program faculty member in order to develop and demonstrate competency in the skill and knowledge necessary to be an effective teacher in a physical classroom, which may include experiences in a virtual classroom. Um, and then another definition from 304 um, is that an educator preparation program shall require multiple opportunities for a program applicant to successfully demonstrate application and knowledge, application of knowledge and skills gained through the program and one or more clinical experiences in collaboration with a licensed teacher over an extended period of time. So on this link in this document, so the top of this, most of this are the general teacher competencies. And this is this is what they look like just copied from board rule. So this is going back to the general pedagogy coursework. Um, so what we have done in other documents such as the um, micro-credential crosswalk is, is we kind of categorize these into to align to the um, university courses that are currently being offered at Slick and SUU. Um, but then when we scroll down, we see the nine clinical experience competencies. Um, so the important thing to know about these is just that um, candidates should have multiple opportunities to demonstrate these. Um, it should not just be like a, a one and you're done or you, you didn't meet it. Um, even though they're the teacher of record, it's also educator preparation. So. Um, and then we also talked about the minimum requirement. So we like to see at least a written description from either someone that's worked with the candidate. Uh, generally, I say just have the candidate do it. Um, they can usually tell you how they've been doing these things, if they've been doing them. Um, so we like to see at least the at minimum the written description. Um, but beyond that, a lot of programs choose to require more, and that's also fine. So. Any question about the clinicals? Um, so you'll notice in at least one, uh, one or both of the definitions of the clinicals, it talked about um, a licensed educator, doing it with a licensed educator. Um, so, so next we're going to talk about mentoring and observations. Um, so this is kind of where that comes into play. So um, one question you'll want to consider in your program is how are mentor teachers selected and assigned? Um, but mentors also must have a Utah professional teaching license and training. Um, ideally, mentor teachers will be master educators who teach in the same grade level. Um, we don't require that though. So you know, you may be in a school that only has like one third grade and one fourth grade. Um, so maybe then you just say, well, it's going to be an elementary teacher 
you know, who's the mentor, which would make sense. Um, as far as what kind of training mentors get, you're welcome to develop your own training or USB also has developed the profession, these professional learning modules for mentor training. So you're welcome to do either of those. Um, and then it also mentioned in the clinicals that they would have candidates would have opportunities to observe, observe, <laughs> observe and be observed. So um, we ask that each program has candidates complete at least one observation of another teacher um, and that that observation is to be kept on file. So a lot of programs require and a lot of LEAs require way more than one. Um, but we we like to see one. So even if more than one are happening, we ask that you at least collect the one. If you want to collect more, that's up to you. But any questions about that? All right. Um, so you may have heard of the Foundations of Reading exam. Um, this was kind of part of the same push as when letters teachers began taking letters. So um, the foundations of reading assessment um, became a requirement in uh, September 1st, 2022. And in order to register, um, you can have your candidates use that link. The test is for elementary, early childhood, and special education license areas. Um, if you have candidates in your program whose PLP was established prior to September 1st, 22, and you may not have any of those in your program, but if you do, those candidates don't have to take the foundations of reading. So everybody else that we talk about, we're assuming they have to take it now. Um, but just remember, if the PLP was established before then, they don't have to take it. So the cut score for the foundations of reading will go into effect September 1st, 2024. So for the candidates that are required to take it, um, if they are not recommended before September 1st, so in like a month, um, and they scored below a 240, they will need to retake the test. Um, there's also an alternative pathway that will be released at the end of August, which is um, a series of micro credentials. And there's another alternative pathway if they scored close to passing but didn't. Um, and Lisa, you probably know a lot more about that than I do. Do you want to talk about that briefly? Sure. So on the foundations of reading tests, they have mostly multiple choice questions, and then they have two written response, like essay type questions. And the essay type questions are the ones that most people don't do very well in. So Pearson has, in partnership with some other states that also require the foundations of reading, they have created what they call the flex option. So if a candidate scored close to within one standard error of the cut score, um, they can qualify for what they call the flex option, which is basically redoing those written response questions. And they're, they're, it's actually set up similar to what you may call a performance assessment, where they're um, they're given a scenario of how they're going to help students with develop their reading skills. They may submit evidence of how they're going to do that, like a lesson plan or um, some student work samples. And they're um, providing some real world hands on experience of how they're helping those students be so successful. And that is taken um, They'll they'll take that evidence, they'll grade it, they'll determine whether you pass. And if you pass the flex option, you're considered to have passed the, the foundations of reading test. So that isn't one option for people who may score close to the cut score, but don't quite get there. And then um, we also are developing micro credentials that they can do in lieu of um, to doing the flex option, because the flex option is, I think, going to be like $60. Um, the micro credentials will probably be close to that because I think we're having three micro credentials and they're twenty dollars each. So um the what I get a lot of questions on is do they can they just do the alt option without taking the test? And the answer is no. In state code all the candidates are required to take the test first. And if they don't pass then they can do an alt option. Um, and another question I get a lot is can letters count as an alt option? And we've had a lot of internal debate on that. And the answer was no, because 
um, letters doesn't have a proctored assessment at the end that we can verify that they've actually completed letters. So unfortunately, we can't use letters as an alternate pathway, um, but they can do the micro-credentials or they can do the flex option. And we'll have more details, um, hopefully in the next month. <laughs> well, we'll have, we're actually setting up a, a meeting with Pearson on the 29th of August, right after our Apple directors meeting, that'll give us some more details about the flex option. And then we should have the micro-credentials up and available by that date as well. Did you see Jessalyn's question? So she's wondering, can we still request vouchers and will oh, that yes. go away? Thank you for reminding me. Um, we we have vouchers indefinitely. Um, the the funding for the vouchers will expire the end of next year, but we are requesting the legislature to continue that funding. So um, at least for the next year, we will definitely have vouchers. Um, basically, vouchers are a coupon code that the candidate uses to register for the test. They don't have to pay for it. Um, candidates will um, basically they need to tell you as their Apple director um, that they need it. They're ready to take the test. And then you email me and say, I have a candidate who's ready to take the test. And you, mm, excuse me, tell me the name of the candidate, their email address. And when they plan to take the test, usually um, it should be within the next three months. And then um, I will email them a copy of the coupon, the voucher code that they need to register and some information on how to register and then they can go ahead and do that. Um, the The summer is pretty busy. I've had some complaints about how they haven't been able to find a time to register for the test in the next two weeks. Um, but there are a couple of things to keep in mind. If they wanna do online proctoring, um, they can, but they have to have a really fast internet speed and they have to meet certain tech requirements, which some people, especially if you're in a rural area, don't usually meet. So we, we highly encourage all candidates to test in a testing center. And they may have to look, each testing center has a different schedule. So they'll have to look at the testing center to see what schedule they are and when they can take the test. But because um, there's a lot, because we're getting to that cut score phase and people want to get their test done before the thing. And it's it's getting a little bit difficult because they're pretty booked up. So um, I would let candidates know that if they're hoping to have it done by August 30th, their that window is rapidly closing. Um, because we're just running out of time. So um, but it also takes like four to six weeks to get their scores back. And so if they're hoping to be done by then, it, they're probably out of time. They're, if they get it done today, they might be able to do it. But next week, we'll definitely be pushing it. So um, otherwise, they'll need to pass with a score of 240 or higher. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. Um, does every candidate has to take foundations of reading elementary, secondary, everybody, right? This is one of those requirements for all licensing? No, it's or just, it just for elementary and early childhood. Okay. And special clarify. ed. Um, so but, everybody but secondary. <laughs> yes, <laughs> basically. And deaf ed. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if they had a PLP established prior to September 1st, 2022, they don't need to take the foundations of reading. How long do we let that slide if they're on that plan for like four years? <laughs> That's up to you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so some of you have maybe heard of uh, what's called the pedagogical performance assessment. Is my mic? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the PPA used to be a requirement up and just until about a month ago. Um, so in May, our board passed a rule um, basically saying that the PPA cannot be a licensing requirement. So, um, so candidates do not have to pass a pedagogical performance assessment. However, for candidates who did, um, we have created these crosswalks. So this crosswalk is for the current competencies. This crosswalk is for the competencies that will be going into effect next year. Um, so you're welcome to, to utilize this crosswalk if the candidate hasn't completed, um, you know, all of the requirements and, and has, you know, maybe they were planning to take the PPAT and then finish things after the PPAT, which is fine. So um, it's just basically a checklist of the, the three PPAs that were state approved. So the PPAT, the TPA, 
and the DPPA, which is the Davis Pedagogical Performance Assessment. Um, and then it just shows which competencies those candidates met if they passed the PPAT uh, or the PPPA, PPA, sorry. <laughs> um, so anyway, you're welcome to utilize that with candidates if, um, if that's relevant. Um, so, so for example, a candidate that passed the PPA or the PPAT in this column here would have met, it looks like the requirements of what we call the ITAP class instruction technology assessment and planning. Um, so if they still had that class to take, but they passed the PPA, the PPAT specifically, then they uh, they wouldn't have to take that. So, but they do have to have a passing score for each of these. So for the PPAT, it was a 36, it was a passing score. So. Okay, I think um, if there aren't any questions, Camilla is gonna talk about um, candidate files and what they need to look like before they're recommended. Yep, so there's some evidence that we ask that you have on file for your candidates before you recommend them just so that everything is good when the time comes to a program review. So they need to have their professional learning plan. Their records need to have official trans copies of transcripts. So those could be either stored at USPE or you could have them on file or we can share them with you. Either way is fine. They need to have at least two evaluations. One of those can be the informal walkthrough and one should be a more formal one that aligns to UITS. If they've completed an endorsement, they need to have the endorsement form on file. For most candidates like elementary, they won't have an endorsement form, but for most of your secondary candidates, they are going to need an endorsement form. Um, we ask that you keep those on file because occasionally they've the endorsement forms have changed and there's been confusion about, well, I'm not sure if they need to do this or that because uh, things have been adjusted on the form. So you want to definitely have a copy of their endorsement form on file. You'll need to have evidence of the clinical competencies being met. The easiest way um, we found that most programs complete those is just having those written in on the PLP, just a brief description of how they, they did those. Um, we also ask that you have evidence of release time and observations of master educators. Um, again, the easiest way that we that people have demonstrated that in the past is to have a brief description of what they saw when they observed the master edu master educator, what they might want to implement in their own classroom. It just needs to be, it doesn't have to be elaborate or long, it can just be simple. And then the last two things that we ask for are score reports for the praxis, if they used it for an endorsement, and the score report for foundations of reading, if they're doing that for elementary or childhood, depending on when their PLP was established. So those are the documents that we ask that you have on file for your candidates before you send in the recommendation. We got a couple of questions about the uh, pedagogical performance assessment. So why don't we answer those? Um, it says if we don't use the PPAT, how would you show those competencies? So the competencies that we reference in that document are the general teacher preparation competencies which means if they don't do a PPAT, then they would need to demonstrate them either by taking a course or completing a micro-credential, as we talked about under the, the general teacher preparation competency area. And generally, that's um, how you would meet any competency. Most of our content requirements are met that way, as by taking a course or completing a micro-credential. And then the other question was... Um, if what if they took the PPAT before there was a passing score required? That's a great question. Um, because the PPAT is now not required, but it is being used as evidence of demonstrated competency, they do need to meet a minimum level of demonstrated competency. So the state has established the cut score of 36. So if you are using the PPAT as evidence that they demonstrated competency, they do need to meet that minimum score of 36 for the PPAT. If you're using the EdTPA, um, the, the cut score varies depending on what content area you're in. And then if you're using the Davis Pedagogical Performance Assessment, they have established a cut score of five. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's, uh, we, we before the cut score went into effect, any score was considered passing, but now that it's being used as an evidence of demonstrated competency, they do need to meet that cut score. All right. Thanks, Lisa. 
And then um, the process for recommend recommending an educator for a professional license. If we, we strongly suggest if you're unsure about something that you reach out to Andrew or myself to review the paperwork before you recommend them for a professional educator license, we'd hate to get to review and have it turn out that someone didn't complete something they needed. So um, I think I think for all the new directors, we ask that you send us your first candidate's file so that we can make sure everything's good to go um, before, before that happens. So you'll submit a letter of recommendation to apple at schools.utah.gov when they've got everything they need. And then the educator will also submit the letter in our, the program SM Apply. Um, we do have a link to a template for the, for the recommendation letter. We hi highly recommend that you use that letter and that you're uh, specific on uh, what endorsements you list if they did an endorsement. We, we just have to be sure that we're exacting what we give the, and what we give the educators. Um, one other thing, if the letter does not state when the PLP was established, especially for elementary and early childhood candidates, we cannot accept it. Um, because we need to know whether or not the foundations of reading score needs to be in that. I believe Camilla pulls those, puts them in cactus when she um, posts the license. So, yep. Thanks, so Andrew. Make sure you have the date the PLP was established. Yep. And if there's something that needs to be adjusted in your letter, I'll just email you, email you and let you know. It generally takes uh, two to three weeks to process those. Sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower, just depending on the season. Sometimes we get a whole lot of recommendations at once and then it takes me a little longer. And if it's uh, slower, then I can be faster. So it generally doesn't take too long for those to happen once the recommendation's been set in, sent in. Um, if you do have an education, if, if the educator doesn't send in the letter of recommendation through SM Apply, I can't process it. So if you find that you've got educators that haven't submitted their letter or you realize, oh, they don't have their license yet, it's probably because they haven't sent in their letter. So please uh, yes. remind them to do that. Yes, thank you, Camilla. One other thing, um, when they submit it in SM Apply, you will get an email. So they have to enter the Apple directory's email in SM Apply um, so then when it's been submitted, it'll send an email to the Apple director. At least that's how we set it up to work. <laughs> yeah. I just assume it's been doing that this whole time, but if it hasn't been, let me know. Um, and then you would also receive an email when we processed it. So, yep. so you, you should know pretty soon whether or not they've, Susan says it has, and she appreciates, appreciates it. Um, thanks for letting me know, Susan. <laughs> Any questions about recommendations? Okay. All right, next Lisa is gonna talk about the annual report. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Okay, so all approved EPPs, including Apple programs and university programs are required to submit an annual report to USPE licensing staff each year regardless of program status. So as long as you're approved, even if you don't have anybody enrolled in your program, you still have to submit an annual report. Usually it's pretty straightforward. You just email me and say, we don't have any candidates enrolled this year. And then you're done. Um, that's what the way it would be this year if you don't have any candidates enrolled. Um, because this year we're just asking for enrollment information. But the information that you submit in this report is used to inform the superintendent's annual report to the legislature and the Title II report to the US uh, Department of Education. So it's very important that the information you submit is very accurate, at least to your best ability. Um, because at USBE, we do not track information on who is enrolled in your programs. It's not something that we have readily available. Um, so the only information we ever get is from you in this report. So it's a very important report. And traditionally, the report has consisted of enrollment information. So who is enrolled in your program? And then there have been follow-up questions on program policies and practices. So that first year that um, we sent out on a report, we asked about what your enrollment policies were. Um, another year, we asked about uh, clinical experiences and mentoring. 
I think another year we asked about, oh, the last year we asked about how prepared you were to have evidence of um, aligning to the new EPP standards. Because there's a lot going on this year with our alignment to the new competencies, we're trying to keep the annual report very simple. So this year, let's go to the next slide. This year, the annual report will just consist of enrollment numbers. So if you have submitted a report in the past, you may know that there's a template where you just list all of the candidates that are enrolled. You'll need to share the name of the candidate, their CACTUS ID, and the license area and endorsements, that could be plural, um, uh, that they're working towards. If they were enrolled in your candidate between September 1st, 2023 and August for 31st, 2024. That, that's all the, uh, the annual report's going to be. And this will be due um, to USPE by 5 p.m. on October uh, 15th, 2024. I believe that's a Tuesday. So that's the absolute latest date we can wait for that report. If um, you do not submit the report by that date, you'll be getting a very strongly worded email from me um, that says you need to submit your report as soon as possible because we have to submit our report to the federal governments by... Um, I think it's November 1st. So it doesn't give us a lot of time. Um, so it's very important that you either submit that um, before October 15th or by 5 p.m. on October 15th. And then let's go back to the, oh, so this, since the report is just on enrollment, um, it we're gonna be asking you who was enrolled in your program between those dates. Now, if they, if they had, Say like your policy says that they have to have a PLP established. So if they had a PLP established and they're considered enrolled, but then they dropped out during that year, that's okay. They should still be on the list. Um, and then also we'll ask, did they earn a professional license during that year or they did they not? Now that could be because they dropped out or because they're still currently enrolled and still working in your program. And that's fine. And we just need to know who was enrolled during that time period. So again, your program gets to establish their own policy for what does enrollment mean. And if you're not sure, you can ask USB for help or guidance or to see what we may have on file for your program. Um, some examples are that usually, from what I've been aware, I haven't heard yet, but all Apple programs require candidates to be employed in a partnership LEA in some capacity. So they could be employed like a part-time teacher. They could be employed as a full-time teacher. They could be employed as a paraprofessional. I think we even have um, an office specialist that's working towards a license. Um, but they have to be employed in a partnership LEA, as far as I'm aware of. Now, um, there could be a program that doesn't require that anymore, and I'm just not aware of it. But that's not a state requirement that they're employed. But as far as I know, all Apple programs require them to be employed in some capacity. And then when we did search, um, we did get information from our programs, about half of them required candidates to have an associate educator license and be a teacher of record. Um, but the other half of the programs either decided they were okay working with candidates that had a LEA specific license or example like paraprofessionals who don't have a license at all usually but they want to get a license. Um, the only caution that we have on that is that even if they're not hired to be a teacher of record, they will still need to demonstrate their clinical experience competencies. So you'll have to give them opportunities to do that. And that may look different depending on where they're at, but it's okay if they're not a teacher of record, as long as they have opportunities to demonstrate those competencies. Any questions on the annual report or what enrollment means? Cool, let's move on. Program review. Um, we're just gonna do kind of a 35,000 feet on program review because we're in a transition period right now. But um, in the, I believe it's R277303, it says that the superintendent will periodically review programs. And for Apple programs, we're aiming to do them every three years, but it may be up to five years. So we have established uniform procedures for reviewing programs. The caveat is, is that <laughs> the procedures that we established for the last four years are changing and we don't have new procedures yet established. So 
Um, most programs have all been reviewed. Um, we think we've got two programs that have not been reviewed at all. So our plan next year is that we'll probably review those two programs before December, but the process might be just really simple. And then we're going to ask for volunteers to do the new process starting in January. So if you're a new program, I probably would not volunteer to do the new process unless you're feeling really on top of things and you really like the new process. Um, but you could just wait it out for a year and, you know, do it next year. But usually for the outcome of program reviews, and this is what we said, like program status, is that there is, we, we've had kind of a three-tier process. Um, so programs that have passed and everything is great, we'll just provide some suggestions for improvement because we believe in this continuous improvement process. And they're considered programs, they're like the green light programs, great, we'll review them, you know, on a three to five year cycle. And then if we reviewed your program and we found some things that are a little bit concerning, that we feel like need to be changed pretty quickly, like within the next year, um, then we'll say your program has passed with stipulations. And then usually we'll check on you at least once a year. And um, we have a couple of programs that are, I think about 10% of our programs have passed with stipulations. Um, but it's just, you know, it's we re recognize that you probably need some additional support. And then we do have, I think we've had one program now, maybe two programs. We're trying to get one program off. But I think we've got two programs that are um, we're, we're on probation. So when we reviewed their program, we had we saw some significant uh, deficiencies where we had concerns about their candidates not meeting the requirements of board rule. And that triggered a program uh, probation. And usually when you get put on probation, you're on a corrective action plan and you follow the policies and board rule regarding corrective action. And you're, you you um, are put on probation for at least a year. And we work through those details of the corrective action. And then um, once those, those steps are met, then we would take you off probation. Um, we we don't like putting programs on probation, but sometimes it happens. And so we work really hard to try and get you off probation if that does happen. Um, but that's usually the three outcomes. Um, the vast majority of our programs, I'd say at least 80% um, pass with suggestions um, because everybody, everything's doing great. And um, we will likely with the new process, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, um, we will likely keep, uh, program outcomes similarly um, because we like to be able to track programs on how they're doing and how much support they may need. So we'll likely have a, a tiered system on outcomes that's similar to that. We may call it something different. But um, the idea is, is that we are trying to review programs periodically because it's important that programs are meeting requirements and that they're also engaging as, in this continuous improvement process. And um, we intend to have details on what the new process looks like released by the end of August, hopefully, it's my, <laughs> is my term. So that if, um, if you would like to engage in that process this year as a volunteer, you're welcome to. Um, we will likely meet with you in January. What we're anticipating that process will look like, because it's going to be focused on the new educator preparation program standards, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And your program will likely need to submit a self-study report that outlines how your program is meeting those standards. And you're gonna provide some evidence of that. And then USBE would review that report and provide some feedback on that. And that report will guide the majority of the discussion that happens during your site visit. Um, we are currently engaging in what we call site visits. Now, it could be done in person or it could be done virtually. It just depends on how you'd like to do that. We, we'd like to try and do them virtually just because it's easier for travel and scheduling, but um, we are well, happy to come on site if that's easier for you. And then we would um, talk about the evidence that in your report and how you're meeting those standards. Um, we will still do a review of files, and that's usually what we've done in the past is that we would, that's like all we do is that we just review like five candidates' files to make sure they have all those requirements that we've talked about today. So we will still do that, um, but there will also be that piece of how are you meeting the standards. And that's generally what will happen, but we'll have details, more details to follow. 
Any questions on program review? Okay, well, you guys are being really easy because I knew that wasn't very specific, so. You're very nice. Um, we'll have some more information. So maybe after that, we'll get lots of questions. And then um, if you're not familiar with the EPP standards, I would highly recommend you at least look those over. They were approved by the board in June, 2023. And these standards apply to all preparation programs, teacher preparation, school leadership, school counseling, and they apply to both Apple programs and university programs. They're going to apply to our apprenticeship program that we're starting this year. They're designed to meet, to, to apply to any kind of preparation program. And this is the first that Utah has had standards for preparation programs. Um, in the past, we've kind of relied on accreditation, like national accreditors, to determine whether our programs are, are effective or not. Um, but we're kind of getting out of that where we've got lots of different types of programs that may or may not do accreditation. And so we still needed to have standards for everybody. Yeah, go ahead and click that link, Andrew. So after much deliberation and um, approval, this is what um, was determined by the board to be the standards for Utah educator prep programs. Um, they're basically divided into three areas. If you scroll down, got some key definitions there. Um, standard one, if you go down, deals with uh, completer competency. So the guiding question here is by the end of the program, can completers effectively demonstrate educator preparation competencies for the license area they are seeking? And then there's three substandards there that we'd be looking for. Can they effectively demonstrate the competencies in board rule? Do they have the experience, knowledge, and skills needed to serve all students with a variety of educational needs? And then do they have goals for their, have they established goals for their own professional growth and engage in self-assessment, goal setting, and reflection? Standard two deals with the systems of support for candidate competency. So it talks about what is your program doing to help the candidates meet competency? For example, does your program provide high quality learning experiences that are aligned to Utah competencies and standards and allow candidates multiple opportunities to demonstrate competencies? Do you seek out and support high quality clinical experiences for candidates? Do you develop and support high quality mentors? And do you prioritize capacity to support candidates as reflected in staffing and institutional resources? And then standard three is um, our continuous improvement and impact standard. So um, does your program engage in thoughtful continuous improvement practices by reviewing performance data and seeking opportunities for innovation and enhancement? And I will say that this um, self-study process that we're looking at for the new system is essentially going to be um, encouraging programs to engage in that continuous improvement process. So in your self-study report, you would look at these standards and you would say, you know, we are providing excellent mentors and this is the evidence that we have that shows that our mentors are excellent, um, but we are struggling a little bit on... Um, possibly scheduling, uh, I don't know, I'm totally making this up, but you, you would identify areas that you might want to make some continuous improvement on. And that's part of that process. And so ideally, the self-study report would be the evidence that you have met that standard. And then um, and anything else that you may do that shows that you're engaging in thought, thoughtful continuous improvement practices. And then also, are you seeking partnerships with stakeholders to strengthen the Utah education system? It's important for programs to be aware that they're part of a whole education system. Um, this one, I know when we did our review last year, was a standard that most Apple programs felt a little bit um, nervous about, that they weren't sure that they had evidence of. So we're going to be talking more about this one in the next couple of months, about what does it look like for Apple programs to have partnerships um, perhaps you've worked with university programs to develop coursework to strengthen your program, or perhaps you're working with schools in your area to meet the needs that they have. Um, you know, that could be an option. Or perhaps you're working with USBE to strengthen the competencies, to develop competencies, um, providing feedback to USBE on how those competencies are working. Those could be all examples of partnerships that you might have that strengthens the education system. Anyway, so there'll be a lot more about this in the coming months as we're all working together to um, incorporate these standards into our programs 
So not a whole lot to do right at the moment, but there will be more to come. Sorry, I have to go write it too, but I have a quick question if I could. Yes, ma'am. Um, so as a new Apple director coming into this, um, what I'm finding is I'm getting a lot of established PLPs from um, UAPCS from different schools as we're having teachers come in, and I'm not sure what to do with those established PLPs. Do I need to convert them into our PLP now, or do I just work with the teacher off of what was on their already established PLP? And then when, um, yeah, I'm just kind of a little yeah. clear on the next steps for that. That is a great question. So a PLP that was established in another preparation program is not the same as your program. So you may have additional requirements that you want your candidates to do or it's things that they require that you don't want them to do. So we assume that when candidates switch programs, they're essentially getting a new PLP. Now that doesn't mean that they have to totally start over. There may be some requirements that they did um, in their other program that would also count for your program. Maybe they took a classroom management class there, which means they won't have to take a classroom management class in your program. Um, but you, you should not be using their PLPs as your established PLP. You really need to be creating a new one for them. Okay. And then for the date of creation, that'll they'll all be for this this like next year. Yes. Yes. Okay, and then um, when, like, ultimately gathering all of that information, is that something that I need to get from the candidate or from the old, the prior program? Another great question. Um, ideally, you would go to the candidate and they would have all that information. Um, the program itself should technically have that. And if you want to reach out to the director and get that from them, you're more than welcome to. Um, in our handbook, we do have... I, I believe we've got transferring programs, a guidance on there that just if you do that, it needs to be done securely and, um, you know, abide by data privacy laws and things so that um, we keep all of that secure. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the information. Sure. Um, Lisa, can I add a question to that? So yes. if they're transferring from one one organization to another, and in the original organization, they would have met the deadline for not needing the foundations of reading exam. If we transfer them over, do we need to add that, or can we um, adopt their original PLP? We have said in the past that if nothing changes, so if you've changed it over and all the requirements are still the same, nothing changes, you could probably keep the original date. Um, but I... I have yet to see that happen, honestly, um, just because there tends to be some changes that don't transfer very well. And unfortunately, I mean, just like if you're transferring the University of Utah to BYU, sometimes all of your credits don't work. So, um, but if if nothing changed, like if you all of the requirements are still the same, then um, they can probably keep the original date. So in that case, would you then recommend if a cooper cooperative arrangement can be made that the original organization keep the PLP and finish those so that they don't have to meet that new requirement or yeah would, if if that's possible if the organization still exists and they're approved and they're they're able to recommend um but that also depends on their enrollment policy because a lot of them you know they have to be employed so i think that's that's the one disadvantage of having locally controlled programs um, that establish their own enrollment policies is that these things happen. And if candidates are switching back and forth, then they may, it may delay them or they may have new requirements that affect them because they're not the same for every program. Great questions. Any other questions? This is just a list of resources that we have available. Um, we have a collaboration folder. We've got regular meetings. There is a listserv that hopefully you guys are all a part of. Um, we usually send everything out in the listserv. 
So if you're not on that, that's the first place to start. And then um, we will get you, there's our website there and we're, we're posting resources on the website in a lot right now because everything's changing. But um, yeah, the nice licensing newsletters, thank you. Those um, often have preparation program information on there, not just licensing. And then we are going to be holding additional webinars and trainings a lot this, this next year because we're transitioning to the new competencies and the educational program standards. And um, so we'll have more of those in the coming months. But as always, if you have an individual question that we didn't answer or you weren't able to attend a meeting, feel free to reach out. We're happy to set up individual appointments with you and help answer any questions you may have.